Um, so my name is Sean Fury and I'm the director of the RWSN Secretariat based at SCAT Foundation in uh, St. Gallen in Switzerland. Uh, very welcome to this very, very special event. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to, to join. I'm, I'm really delighted that we are um, co-hosting with the uh, Water Youth Network and the uh, FSM Fail crew and some uh, some long-standing RWSN members, and really uh, a something that I we haven't really done before is as RWSN in such an intentional way to kind of get a intergenerational exchange um, both between um, uh, oldies and youngies and 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 middleies. Uh, you can. Uh, see where, where I fit into that. Anyway, I'm going to try and move the slides forward. There we go. So on today's webinar, we've got a fantastic crowd of, of, of people that have joined us that from all over the world um, who will get to know a bit more about and uh, our, my colleague Esther from uh, UNICEF in, in, in Copenhagen will introduce you, everyone uh, as we get to them. Uh, but just to let you know that we've got a really diverse um, range of experiences uh, from around the world and different age groups, which we're looking forward to hearing from today. But before we get there, I just want to do a quick bit of background in, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our WSN as the Rural Water Supply Network. Uh, we are the only global uh, practitioner focus network dedicated to rural water supply. And since 20, 1992, we've been leading collective action to accelerate progress towards universal sustainable water services with a focus on people in rural areas. Um, so this is, yeah, th 30 years ago in Kakamega in Kenya, a, there was a workshop on hand pumps and a, group, a small group of people came together. And from that came the idea of establishing a hand pump technology network that then later evolved into the rural water supply network and, and today has over 13,000 uh, members. Uh, over that those three decades, the areas that we've kind of really been able to add value in terms of really contributing something is to provide networking uh, opportunities and a helpline for those that want to Get answers to questions and get the and to help others that are also facing similar challenges. To be a knowledge hub for um, uh, essential information on uh, on whether it's on pump technology or drilling or how to apply the human right to water at a practical level, all those sorts of things. Increasingly, we're getting into training and, and standards uh, around uh, what what skills are needed, and this is something I'll come come back to because I think this is very much where where our future lies. And then finally, that uh, the there are new there are new ways of uh, or a mix of ways of delivering rural water services and uh, enterprises and and, and uh, different levels from. Uh, small small time entrepreneurs up to big companies have a role to play but there's a need for uh, investment at the appropriate level so just as focus said for, for a moment on the lifelong learning which is a strategy that we've developed over the last few months and is on the front page of our website if you want to have a look at the more detail but it really it's about supporting uh, rural water professionals throughout their career um, from um, but when they're making sure that there are uh, there are colleges and universities that are teaching the right skills um, and the right the right uh, knowledge uh, to mentoring young professionals, we've had a very successful mentoring program over the last couple of years. To mid career, those that are maybe moving from a more technical role to a more managerial role, and the, and some of the big steps that happen in your thirties and forties. Um, and then at the senior level, those that are, uh, are leading teams, leading organizations, running businesses, but need to keep up to date with what with what's happening. And then and then finally, this uh, the importance of those who are retired or semi retired and giving the opportunities and uh, space to share that wisdom that's hard learned over many years um, back to to earlier generations and uh, and, to, and to younger people. So that's very much uh, what, the, what this is, event is about. So please, 
after this event please to go to our website have a look at our strategy document please give us your thoughts on on what we can do as a network uh, to do more in this space around training and mentoring and intergenerational exchange um I'm very, I'd just like to thank very much uh, everyone involved in organising today's event, particularly um, the team at Secretariat, Melissa and, and Aline, but also all our, our speakers and contributors today. Uh, thank you very much. So over to um, I'd like to hand over to Esther, please. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Um, hi, everyone. As Sean correctly introduced, I'm Esther from UNICEF. I'm based in our supply division, but I'm here today representing our um, wash failures work, which I do with a couple of other people. So in the interest of keeping things slightly more interesting, ooh, two interests, I am going to share my screen and then we're going to ask some questions because um, I want to understand from you guys a little bit or help you to understand why we should be talking about failure. So all being well and smooth, there'll be some polls popping up. But my first question to you, and it's a real or fake is the answer. So you should be able to cope with that. I'm going to read out a scenario and you're going to tell me whether it really happened or if it's fake. OK, so the first one is um, a project team decided to reduce open defecation on a coral atoll by carrying out CLTS. Unfortunately, the drinking water source ended up contaminated with fecal pathogens. So tell me, was this a real situation or a fake situation? Did this really happen or not? Did the project team manage to reduce open defecation by carrying out CLTS? And did then the water source end up contaminated with fecal pathogens? I've got one person, I think there's about 70 odd people, 82 people. So come on, guys, real or fake that this happened? Come on, I've got three, I've got three. Come on guys, out of 82, it's only 4%, 5% have voted now. Oh, I love these stats. I love a good bit of statistics. Um, okay, I'm gonna assume you're all rushing to your computer because you didn't realize it was participatory and you were still making coffee so that you could sit and enjoy this. The fact is this one is true. There was no funding for infrastructure. So the community couldn't afford to install improved sanitation, so they dug pit latrines. And this in turn contaminated the fresh water, their primary source of water. And it's evident from everyone voting that it's kind of obvious that these failures happen, but without sharing them and talking about them, it's hard to know whether or not they're true uh, or whether or not we can address them. Okay, so the second one is, during a demonstration by a local MP, a local politician, on the security of a new latrine, he got himself locked inside the toilet and needed to be rescued by members of the community. Is this real or fake? And we're not talking about Boris Johnson hiding in freezers, which for the Brits you will find highly entertaining. Um, OK, this is interesting. A lot of you have gone with real. This one's actually fake um, and one that we came up with uh, to prove a point. OK, the last one. A child became locked in a hanging toilet but heard that his favourite movie star was nearby. In desperation to meet him, he jumped through the toilet, landing in a pit of faecal sludge. OK, this one, we've got about a 50-50 split. And um, while many of you believe it could have happened, this one is a scene from Slumdog Millionaire, which if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, the book's way better than the movie, I recommend you do because it's a great bit of literature. So why are we doing this? Well. The idea of these questions is to highlight that things can and do go wrong in the water and sanitation sector. And based on these votes, even the real, even the fake ones could have been real. OK, I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you, guys. Um, that was great. So. Um, OK, I'm going to hide that. Great. So I'm just going to introduce you quickly to the wash failures team, which includes myself. Um, Danny Barrington, who's on the call and able to answer any questions, and Becky Sindor, who is in the air somewhere between here and Malawi. And between the three of us, we recognise that failures mainly were being discussed in the shadows with professionals the world over continuously making the same mistakes. And failure can be difficult to talk about. 
but they also have impacts. Money's wasted, people can get harmed. And if we're going to achieve universal water and sanitation, we need to do better. We need to learn from one another's work to inform and improve what we're doing. So over the past five years, we've attempted to foster this change through the wash failures movement, um, how we can address them, how we can facilitate this culture of sharing and learning from failure. And that culminated in the Nakuru Accord, um, so named because it started in Nakuru in Kenya. And the Nakuru Accord outlines how we can fail better in the wash sector. Different stakeholders have varying ideas on how universal water and sanitation can be achieved. Um, for an example, an NGO may consider a project successful because each household has a pit latrine, but residents in the same village might consider this a failure because for them, their vision was a flush toilet. Um, as an evaluator, they may consider the project a failure because after two years of completion, half the pits have collapsed and the intended users have reverted to open defecation. It's not always clear cut. Stakeholders have different ideas of what success looks like. It, they may have different ideas of what failure looks like. And we need to understand the needs and expectations of different stakeholders, even within the same organization sometimes. WASH professionals need to anticipate this and ideally prevent it. More, ideally, we want to stop failures before they happen or be able to manage them if they do occur. And we need to be in a position to reduce the size of those failures if we can't prevent them. So with a view to that, um, the failures project is trying to share learning opportunities and how we can address them, but also include reflection to avoid similar repetitions in the future. So during this webinar, we're going to be discussing how we can learn from each other. Larry's written uh, and documented some of his experiences in his book that's available via the RWSN network. It reflects on his experiences finding rural water in uh, Mexico, Malawi and Cambodia, but the, the implications could be translated to anywhere. The book closes with a set of lessons aimed at sustainability, many of which are in line with the Nakuru Accord on your screen. And our research, speaking with field staff in four sub-Saharan African countries and their perceptions of why projects fail, it's all there's a lot of similarities. So using all of this, we're hoping for a discussion on how to go about achieving project sustainability and learning from each other in this webinar. So that's enough from me. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have some cool videos uh, of discussions of intergenerational learning. So we're going to have Larry, Hank and Jim talking with our um, Young Water Networks team. And I just want to say I'm really grateful to the Young, to the Youth Water Network for their support on this webinar. They have done an amazing example setting with their World Toilet Day 2021 compilation on sharing um, sharing and learning that allows people to talk openly when things go wrong. And it's a great example of what we're hoping to see more of in the sector. So it's great to have Ignatius Temple and Persis join us as well um, for this. So our first little snippet of learning is from Larry and Persis. So Larry Siegel was the executive director of the small NGO Safe Water International. He, during that period, he worked on rural drinking water and sanitation projects in Mexico, Malawi and Cambodia. And for two years, Larry served as the technical officer and board member in the Water and Sanitation Rotary Action Club, uh, sorry, group, and is a WASH consultant within that group. Persis it works as the program officer for the Global Water Partnership in the Caribbean, overseeing projects and programs related to international water resource management in that region. She's a bachelor's in civil engineering with an MSc in water and sanitation from the University of Leeds. She's a member of the Shevening alumni community. I'm sure I said that wrong. Um, and the WASH cohort for the Youth Water, uh, Water Youth Network. She's also part of the IWA, the International Water Association, and she's currently based in the Dominican, but actually coming to us live from New York today. So with that, over to our little interview. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Um, I know that this intergenerational knowledge transfer conversation will be incredibly engaging. So I would like to start by saying that in your book, I tried to save the world and I failed. I love the title, by the way. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that your time in Vietnam as a member of the U.S. Uh, Army Civil a first team sparked the creation of Safe Water International. And I would like to know a little bit more of how you came to be in the water sector. Uh, I think that story is 
really the pivotal moment for me. Um, this position I had in the in the Army was what I would characterize as an armed Peace Corps volunteer. I worked with a small team on development projects uh, in rural communities and found uh, to my surprise that uh, several of those communities were primarily interested in water. And it was my first experience of beginning to understand just how vast this need for rural water is. Uh, later, I worked on the uh, safe water legislation uh, in the US Congress uh, with a couple of individuals who were very inspirational to me. They were professors at Cornell University and ran a water research uh, program there. So uh, both of those experiences, uh, I think, form the strong interest that I, I developed in rural water. I would also like to know uh, from all of those international experiences that you had delivering these services to these rural and remote communities, um, what do you feel most proud of about uh, your career? I have to be careful in answering that um, because I think there are people whose accomplishments have been far grand, grander than mine. But I think the one thing that really sticks in my mind uh, is uh, the involvement of my organization, Safe Water International, with the establishment of the Smart Water and Training and Sanitation Training Center in northern Malawi. Uh, I was involved with writing the grant that funded the initial establishment of the center. And Safe Water International was the first organization to make a financial pledge to the organization. So I feel that uh, it was something that I can look back on with some satisfaction that I was involved in an organization which has had, truly had a national impact in the country of Malawi. Yeah, truly. Um, I think uh, I wholeheartedly agree with, with that message. And I think that throughout the book, um, that is that light <laughs> that you wrote to the sum of light, as you mentioned in the book, was very well reflected. Well, now for a not so smooth shift of gears, uh, in my next question, I will ask you to share what do you consider was the biggest failure in your career? And what was the main lesson that that experience gave, uh, gave you? A couple of things come to mind. One is uh, my failure to understand early on uh, in my work on rural water, the depth of the commitment, the length of the commitment that I was making to the communities that I worked in. Um, as I explained to some degree in the book, um, it's a matter of a you're making a commitment over a period of years, really, whenever you start a, a rural water project. And as an example, uh, it's been about 12 years since uh, some of the wells that I worked on in Malawi were established, and several of them still require attention and support. Uh, a, a second failure, I think, was what I would title hubris, uh, uh, sort of a personal failure. Uh, because I thought that the projects we were doing in Cambodia really were the solution to a sustainable project. Uh, the groundwater resources there were plentiful, such that in central Cambodia, almost every family could, could have their own wealth if they could manage it and, and financially afford one. Um, I was involved in establishing 15 or 20 wells in different communities. and. Uh, Families were overjoyed, of course. And then the groundwater levels receded. It was a surprise to me. I don't know if it was a surprise to the, to the well owners. And families were, uh, had, were forced to rip the lid off the well, sometimes breaking the water intake pipe, and then just discarding the lid and the pump attached to it so that they could get access to whatever water remained in the well with the roped bucket, which of course is the, one of the worst, most unsanitary ways of obtaining water. Uh, so my assumptions going in proved to be very short term. I just ex accepted that this was this circumstance of the wonderful groundwater was gonna last forever. 
And of course, I was dead wrong. Well, thank you so much for sharing those experiences with me. Um, finally, I wonder if you have a piece of advice for um, me as a young professional, or even what do you think uh, the Larry of 1970 would like to hear from all those years of experience in the water sector? Well, I'll give you a double seagull answer. My, my daughter uh, is on the Peace Corps staff in Indonesia and has uh, worked for the Peace Corps for about eight years. Um, and I read these questions to her and she reminded me of something that's so important. And that is um, devoting the bulk of your time early in the project planning process to developing personal relationships. Uh, with everyone involved in the project from top to bottom, from the most important to the least important person. Um, she has a formula at the beginning uh, of activity, 80% 80, 80 of the time uh, devoted to cultivating personal relationships, 20% of the time. Uh, and then that equation changes as, as time goes by. Uh, that's related to a, a, a second kind of thought, which is to look for mentors. As you are working on a project, you would like to know what others working on the same kind of project are doing and what their successes and failures are. And if you're lucky, you will encounter people who are good teachers and who can help make a difference in, in your life and, and in your practices. Larry, this has been a fascinating conversation. It was a joy and a pleasure to share this time with you. Congratulations once again on the launch of your book. I had an amazing time reading it, and I'm sure everyone else is going to as well. Thank you. Great, thanks. And um, I really like, Larry, kind of your, your points at the end very much relate to what Sean was saying with RWSN. Um, and I think this point about having, um, having spending time on forming relations should apply to anything. I think in any workplace, um, spending time on those relationships is important. And I think COVID has highlighted how important over the last few years as well. Um, Persis and Larry, were there any questions that you kind of didn't get time to discuss or anything that came up in your discussions? Because that was the highlights, I'm sure. Um, yeah, Larry, was there anything from your side that you didn't get to say? Not so much. Um, you know, I'm always aware of the fact that my experience was narrow and uh, a lot of what I wrote and what I've said is meant to provoke others to come up with better observations. So uh, I, I'm just so grateful that we've had this opportunity to use the book as a catalyst for, for the conversation. I think there's a lot to be said about the feasibility of sustainability as it's generally discussed. And I do that in the book, but otherwise I think uh, Persis uh, drew out some of the main things that I was willing, I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, Persis, I know you're on a bit of an unstable connection, but is there anything from your side, just quickly, um, before we continue on to the next little snippet? Yes, for sure. So I just wanted to thank once again, uh, Larry, for allowing me the opportunity to interview him. I wanted to mention that it came across both in the book and also the publication that we did in the Water Youth Network, that one of the main resources for these projects to fail is failing uh, to understand the, concept, the context in which these water issues are, are set. And um, surprisingly, not only or not mainly the technical context, but the social context and the cultural background as well. So this is something that came across in both our publication and also in Larry's book. And it's something that we should also pay attention to um, in terms of understanding failure. Great, thank you. And I'm aware we've got a, a question in the chat. I actually want to save this to the end because I want um, the whole panel to have a chance to respond. So we'll come to the question in the chat. 
But next, we're going to go to Henk and Temple. So Henk Holstag has a background um, as a ship engineer uh, and in 1987 went to Nicaragua. Um, after a failed wind pump project, he started with rope pumps, manual well drilling and household water filters. Since 1998, he promotes these and other smart water technologies in Africa. He's a senior advisor of the MetaMeta Meta Smart Center Group. And these centers train local artisans in nine countries to locally produce affordable wash technologies. And Temple is a water and environmental engineer from Nigeria. Temple practices as an independent wash consultant and has supported several wash interventions in Nigeria and globally. He's currently an advisory board member for the Water Youth Network. He's also a program coordinator of Nigeria Young Water Professionals and the co-lead of the Leave, I'm assuming Leave No One Behind, the LNOB theme at RWSN. But please, Temple, later on, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, Melissa, over to you with the video. How did you come to be in the rural water sector? In the water supply sector, yes. Um, I'm, my background is a ship's engineer. Uh, so I, I worked on ships for eight years. And after that time, I had my first midlife crisis. I thought, what will I do with the rest of my life? Um, so my brother was working in development aid in, in Africa. So I decided to do the same. I went to Tanzania with SMV and I worked in a fishing program, fishing project. And later on, I went to Nicaragua. I worked in a, a big project for windmills for irrigation. Uh, but that project was a big failure. So because Whoa. the windmills were too big, too expensive for the local context. So with colleagues, we started to work on a simple technology called the rope pump. And that did work. That, is, that became very successful. And now there is over 50,000 rope pumps in Nicaragua. Wow. And then later on, yes. we, we started to do the same with colleagues in, in Africa. 20 years ago, I started to work in Africa with the same concept, including well drilling, etc. So a range of technologies. And that is true. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Interesting. Okay, so um, um, what are you most proud of in your career? Um, I think the same project in Nicaragua, um, it's because we started to train 30 years ago uh, uh, local workshops in producing the rope pump. And, and, and since it was a, an affordable technology, a simple, it became very successful. And even by now, there is 50,000 rope pumps functioning uh, in Nicaragua for both small communities, but even more for farmers, for families. And I think the most interesting part of that is that the companies that we have trained, most of them are still producing. So the logic is that after the training, they went on doing it because they make profit. And we see oh. the same in Africa. 15 years ago, I, we started, for instance, to train Mr. Labanka Duma in Tanzania, who was a person with a, a, a wheelbarrow or a spade and a bike. And, and now he has a training company. He has a company with three drilling teams and he drilled over 2000 wells in, in, in Tanzania. And he goes on after the training. So I think that is what I'm proud of. Well, it, mu it must be very fulfilling to see um, your initiative um, impacts lives and livelihoods of several people across the world. Um, away from the what you're proud of, let's talk about the failures now. Um, I know you've mentioned one. <laughs> um, so what would you say are the biggest failures um, in your career and what you've learned from the uh, failures? Well, I guess I, had, I have many failures. I always say probably I have more experience with failures than with success. But And one yeah. failure was, was Ghana. We started to introduce the rope pump in Ghana, uh, you know, 25 years ago. And, 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 and the, there were 200 wind, uh, rope pumps installed in, in Ghana. And after one year, 80% of the pumps were not functioning anymore. Wow. Uh, that is a big lesson learned. But in short, again, you know, the selection of the sites were not good. There was no management organization. There was no money for repairs. There were errors in the production. So a lot of, a lot of problems, a lot of technical problems, but also social problems. And 
so I think one of the or, or, or a few of the lessons learned is uh, is simple is not easy. You know, a technology like yeah. a robot looks simple, but if you don't do it right, there's many details that can go wrong. If you make a, a, a wrong guide blocks, the rope will break in one week. So, well, and that is brought me to the second lesson learned is, which is the, the three T's. I always call it the three T's. If you want to be successful, you need to invest in the three T's. Uh, okay. Can you mention what it stands for? The three T's? Yes. No, I would like to learn from you now. Well, I'll help you. The first T stands for training. Good. So what would be the second T? Uh, training um, time? Uh, no, the second T stands for training. And the third T? The first T. The first T stands for training. Yes, yeah. and the second T stands for training and the third T stands for training. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, so, and not training only on the technology, but also on all the other aspects to make something a success. So it's it's not only learn how to, 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 to build a good rope pump, but also, you know, how to market it, how to make a good business. Yeah, there is a lot of other things that are critical for success. Okay, so um, finally, um, I'm at the start of my career, and um, if you were in my shoes, what are the one to two big things um, or pieces of advice that you would yeah. want to tell yourself, your younger self? Um, well, we should spend a day on that one, but I think the most important advice that I could think of is learn from the past. We have made so many mistakes in the past, but also there is increasing success. And so again, learn from the past. And now the good thing is that there is RWSN, there is the D groups, there is the field notes. There is a lot of experience in RWSN. Yeah. There is one book on cell supply and yes, there is one book yes. on rural water supply from Sally Sutton and Richard Carter, which are, okay. you know, you want to know about rural water supply that's these books you have to read. Another website that you can visit is NICC. It is 70 years of experience of development aid, including rural water supply. So this is again my advice learn from the past. Lots of experience. Great, thanks. Um, I don't know if you've seen in the chat, Hank, but Rainier has mentioned that your joke has been around a while, but still stands strong. And I do wonder if this is one of the things about learning earlier in the sector is which jokes can stand the test of time and which can't. Well, I think it's important that we get more humor in the water sector also. So I don't know. Um, well, I'm more on the sanitation side and we've definitely got a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe <laughs> we should learn from you then. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And thank you. And Temple and Hank, um, the same question to you guys, I guess. Is there anything that came up in the chat um, that wasn't shown there that, you know, was really impactful? I don't know, Temple, if you want to go first, hopefully um, your connection will hold up for us. You'll have. Yeah, great. Oh, oh yeah. So thank you very much, um, Esther. I think this has been uh, the, the chats was actually very engaging and um, enlightening and I actually missed the joke. <laughs> <And obviously, laughs> that was to confirm that it still stands and I'm sure it's going to be there for a long time because yeah, we cannot overemphasize the importance of uh, training and I'm happy and I'm glad that uh, Hank has actually brought this to the fore to the, the trade seas. So that's one thing I'm holding, I held on to and I'm still holding on to from our engagements. And uh, it's also good to learn and see that uh, we're beginning to document our failures and share lessons learned from the failures and not just focusing on the things that are successful. So I'm happy with the engagement and I, I'm sure we, we are going to keep uh, the discussion going. Um, Thanks. That's that Thanks, me. Yeah. Great, we'll come back to you, don't worry, there's time. Um, Hank, how about you? Um, well, maybe 
I would like to mention the, another lesson learned in all these years, which is the importance to focus on water for productive use also. I mean, almost all the water projects worldwide focus on health, focus on drinking water, uh, and, and normally done this by communal water supply. And in the last, especially in the last five years to 10 years, we see the importance and the potential of what we call self-supply. Um, I can really encourage the group, the people that are watching to participate in the D group, the RWSN D group on self-supply, because we have seen that if you focus on family systems um, and you stimulate families to invest themselves, and maybe we have some subsidy of the poorest, but if you stimulate families, they will take care for the pump, but they also have convenience. It takes, it, shares, it saves time for women and girls to, to collect water. Um, they may have income from the pump because they grow some vegetables. You see, if we want to have rural development, we really need to focus on household level water supply, if possible, of course, not everywhere is possible. And that's where the low cost technology are very important. But again, uh, join the group, the D group of RWSN on self-supply, and that will be a very interesting development. Thanks, Hank. And Mike's made an interesting point in the chat around institutional memory and reinventing the wheel. And that was very much where the wash failure stuff was born from. The idea that somebody has probably faced this challenge before and there probably is a solution that may not fit, but you can at least build from. So why do we start from scratch over and over again? And interestingly, I was at a conference last week that said exactly the same thing as what you've just said. These water pumps lead to additional benefits. So why are we not promoting that more to get the ownership and the kind of integration within family management? And it's stuff that we should know as a sector, but we still someone will go, wow, that's a really good innovation. Uh, and you're like, no, it's been around a while. Um, great. We'll come back to all of maybe, this in the maybe, oh, one, maybe one short observation there is a colleague of mine always said everybody has the right to his own frustration. And of course, we, we want to everyone to learn from the past, but we also have to acknowledge that people have to experience themselves. That takes time. That's very true. And I think engineers in particular are very much, they need to, they're quite tactile people and need to go through processes. And I think that's a really valid point. We might come back to that. Um, okay, our last video, we're saving the best till last, I promise. Uh, we have got Jim and Ignatius. So Jim McGill has been working with WASH programs for development in Africa since 91. Uh, he began in rural Malawi with hand, hand dug wells and ECOSAM. He later worked to establish SMART, simple market-based affordable repairable technologies training center for WASH in Mzuzu with Hank. He is currently establishing SMART centers in both Niger and South Sudan. Hence, he's been having some internet problems in Niger. And Ignatius is a graduate water engineer technologist from Namibia. He's also a member of the Water Youth Network, and he joined after participating, participating and being part of the winning team for the YWN Hackathon in 2020. I do love a hackathon. I'm in innovation. He's currently unemployed in the water sector, but I'm fairly sure it won't be for too long. Um, he's into research for potential opportunities uh, in the wash sector and is continuing his involvement with the Water Youth Network. Okay, Melissa, over to you for the last video. And I, I work with the local church. Right now I'm in Niger. I spent about 25 years in Malawi. Uh, right now I'm working in Niger and in South Sudan on, uh, on all aspects of WASH, uh, pretty much focusing on low, uh, low cost solutions so what we call smart techs uh, simple market-based affordable repairable technologies so trying to establish uh, establish local private sector to be able to uh, provide services to provide products uh, so the yeah, idea is to bring the cost down so more and more people can have access self-supply access or just access uh, by quality products, but at lower cost. Okay, That's thank you. Doing. All right, uh, to begin with our interview, uh, quickly tell us, how did you come to be in the rural water sector? Uh, well, 
My father was uh, a physician in rural Malawi, and I had just gotten married, and my wife got her bachelor's degree in nursing, wanted to go on to get her master's in nursing, but she wanted to spend a year working with my father. So we went out to Malawi and we're working there. I was working pretty much in hospital maintenance, uh, which included putting guttering and putting covered walkways, putting guttering on all the roof. And part, uh, starting uh, some rainwater catchment within the hospital to try to relieve the hospital water shortages. But then in the dry season, we also had uh, we had many people coming to the hospital to get their water. So it was a big burden. So we started a program with a hand dug well program uh, to, to get water to those villages. Uh, so they would have water and not come to the hospital. And that's, that's what got me hooked and uh, got me involved in, in WASH. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, with the next question, uh, can you tell us, uh, what are you most proud of in your career being in the rural water sector? Yeah, I guess I'm most proud of working as working in sanitation. Um, and back when when we started these water programs, everyone would say sanitation is the second side of a coin. That anytime you have a water program, you have to have a sanitation program as well. But that was just yeah people talking mostly, there wasn't a whole lot of attention paid to sanitation. Uh, and secondly, uh, when you go into a village, when you go to talk to people and ask what their priorities are, water is always a very high priority. No one ever asks you for a latrine. I think we know what the importance of sanitation is, but uh, just I think the challenges to that come along with sanitation uh, was what excited me to get involved in sanitation. So we started a, an ecological sanitation. It took a long time before we uh, hit the tipping point, got 100% coverage in a village. When that happened, it was it was awesome. Can you tell us, you being have worked in the sanitation sector for quite a number of years, tell us what is your biggest failure and what have you learned from that? Yeah, I just have to say the biggest failure that I've been a part of was a large gravity fed piped water scheme. Uh, the original scheme had been put in a hundred years ago, it was galvanized pipes, so the pipes were all rotting out and they really needed replacement. So we had some funding from Rotary Club um, and we knew that the source was big enough to, to supply more people with water uh, and we knew we had the funding that we could uh, expand the system. So we, we made a plan to go ahead and expand the system to about 15,000 more people. Uh, and I'd like to say that almost everything that was done with the project was done very well. Uh, the design was right, uh, implementation was done well. We had a payment scheme that was linked to the government water payment scheme so that if prices went up, our, our prices went up. Uh, right, uh, um, in the same manner. Uh, and we had a lot of innovations. We had a payment uh, scheme with tokens. It was based after the scratch card for, for telephones, cell phones, so that all the money would stay in the office, and, but people could access ways to pay for water at any time of day. Uh, so <clears throat> with the payment, we had about six years to work on management issues and it came, uh, we had a very good management system in place with uh, the mission station with the, the community and a, an independent professional management manager a team. But what happened was people saw the profits that were coming in. We had leadership within the community that saw uh, that they could make a good profit themselves. So there's a bit of a coup d'etat that happened and they got rid of our manager and took control basically of the management themselves. And the first thing they started doing was to put in illegal taps. So when you start putting in illegal taps, 
then your design is all messed up. Your payment system is messed up because we were on a meter system and you were paying against the meter, but if you don't have meters on the new taps, messes up the whole system. So, um, you know, I think we, we learned a lot from that uh, program. Uh, but where we where we failed, I believe, is just not having the the thought of that there would be a coup d'etat that people would be seeing this kind of profit as something that they could uh, take themselves, and uh, what devastation that 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 action would have uh, on the system. All right. Okay, uh, as I've mentioned in my introduction, that I'm a graduate civil engineer. So I'm at the beginning early stage of my career. So if you are in my shoes, what uh, maybe one or two advice advice that you would give, you'd want to tell your younger self? Yeah, well, first, I think I would want to make sure that I understood that doing proper development takes a lot of time. You know, you, you, to have a more of a programmatic approach at whatever you're doing than a project approach. Um, you know, when I when I think of doing development, I think of an exponential curve. Uh, and in the exponential curve, there's a point what you could call a tipping point. You know, you're going along, there's not a whole lot of change, and all of a sudden you hit something and that changes everything and, and then everything takes off. And I think in development work, what we're trying to do is to reach that tipping point. And how do you do that? Well, I don't think you can do it without that length of time before you hit the tipping point. You need a lot of trial and error, a lot of learning. Uh, when a lot doesn't get done during that time, from outside, it looks like not a lot's being done. And that causes problems with your donors. As a lot of donors uh, are in the mentality of, you know, my best bang for my buck is when I can get X number of installations or boreholes or whatever for this amount of money. And the, the more boreholes I can get for the least amount of money, the better. But I think the way to think about the bang for the buck is when all the in implementation is out, when every, everybody's gone, what's left standing, what's still functional. Uh, and in order to find out what that's function, what will remain functional, I think you have to hit that tipping point. Great, thanks. Um, and another interesting perspective, the reality is, you know, uh, failures happen in multiple different reasons. And, you know, Jim, a coup d'etat probably would be quite far from many of our planning and thinking. Um, so it is understandable, though elections do stop projects all the time. So I wonder if it's like a watered down version of election problems. Um, Ignatius, just quickly, is there anything from your side that you guys and keep it quick, because I do want to get to this one question, which I think all of you will appeal will appeal to all of you from uh, that's in the question box. Uh, so Ignatius, was there anything particularly outstanding from that chat that you just wanted to share for the benefit of others? Okay, I actually I wanted to ask, uh, it's a question regarding the low cost ecological, I mean, the low cost sanitation technology that he is dealing with in, I wanted to know the most commonly one because I, in my country, most of them are not really commonly used. Jim? <clears throat> ecological. Sorry, my internet is not so good right at the uh, moment. Okay. Um, but, uh, okay. Ecological sanitation, I, I follow pretty much right out of, I follow from Peter Morgan. Uh, he has a lot of stuff on the internet that can be accessed. It's also a book, uh, uh, com Toilets That Make Compost. But basically, normally you start with what we would call the arbor loom, which you just dig a one meter deep pit and when that's full, you plant a tree and move on to the next one. Uh, when people get tired of digging new holes, then you we use what's called the fossa alterna, where you start uh, filling one pit. Uh, when that's full, you switch over to another pit. After a year, you're able to harvest that manure and then use it like that. 
just the third one is the sky loop. It's the same thing as the 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 auger loop. I mean, the same as the fossa alterna, except that the vaults are above ground, so you access the manure from from vaults. Great, Thank thanks, Jim. Um, okay, so I've got this one question from Garemu in uh, Ethiopia that I've been sitting on since we started because I think it's such a great question. Um, his question is, is failing better, including failing to understand the cause of failure? So his experience shows that the cause of non-functionality is usually not clearly identified, and that in itself is another failure. So he's working in Ethiopia in academia, but also as a wash advisor for the ministry. And this, for me, hearing this question coming at that level from the ministry is really progressive in many ways, because often, as far as ministries are concerned, everything's fine, everything's perfect. They're doing exactly what they plan to do. So in your experiences, and please, Temple Ignatius and Persis, just because you're earlier in your career doesn't mean your responses aren't valid. What are your experiences of identifying failure and getting acceptance of that to then be able to address it. And one of the resources Danny shared in the chat is the pre-mortem from Susan Davis, who's on the call, uh, which is something that I'm a big fan of. But I'd be interested to hear from our panel if there's any particular thoughts on this. Don't all speak at once. Well, I'll start. Um, working in rural communities is a fairly straightforward endeavor. And I think failure is simply the lack of op proper operation of whatever it is that you're trying to install. Um, whether or not you fully understand all of the social and cultural and technical causes of that failure, it's pretty clear there's a failure. And the, the response is also relatively clear in terms of whether or not you're going to be able to, um, to mend the problem in a way that'll have some life to it. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, yeah, maybe I'd like to add that failure often is, again, a lack of, and I repeated the three T's, it's probably the lack of, you know, the, the person that designed the project maybe did not have enough experience, maybe the engineer that did it did not have the right skills. So whatever, um, whatever you install you should you should do it in the right way and that takes that takes experience that takes skills and that is in what is lacking in many countries the you know the right skills to do something right so what what we really need um, and I, I i would like to repeat something that was said in the stockholm water week four years ago it said that to reach this sdg6 we need a kind of Marshall Plan for capacity building. We need a large scale building of local capacity in all the levels that you need to reach the AGCs. And this is, I think, something that is lacking. There is small training programs, you know, every now and then. But what we really need is a huge large scale capacity building on, on all the levels that you need to reach the AGC. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks, Hank. Um, Temple and Persis, I can't see you, but I just wonder if either of you two want to add anything, um, or Ignatius, is there anything you guys want to yeah. add? Oh. Yes, for Persis. sure, Esther. Um, yes, I think that absolutely, um, in order to understand failures, we do need to pay attention to the causes or responding the why these failures happen. And I don't think that it is a matter of uh, pinpointing just one thing in many cases and this is my opinion of course I think that when failures in wash happen they happen at different levels and they involve uh, different uh, settings of causes not only technical but behavioral and in many cases lack of capacity building as one of the speakers just point, pointed out but yes definitely uh, we need to pay attention on the why just in order to avoid uh, the repetition of, of this and also to also have always um, the focus on the people which are the beneficiaries and receptors of these interventions it's not a matter of um, basing the solutions on a, on a technology or 
on a person that has a certain technical capacity is just making sure that uh, the beneficiaries of the interventions of the, pro of the project are using the appropriate technology that they do need to address this issue and that the technologies have certain scale of sustainability. So I would also like to mention that if you are interested in understanding failure, just to follow uh, watch failures because Esther and Danny, as they mentioned, they have a publication coming on later this year. So yes, just stay tuned on that. And that was my intervention. Thank you, Esther. Ah, oh, thanks, Princess. It's so nice of you to promote what we're doing as well. And actually, there's a great discussion going on in the chat with Matthias and Danny and a few others um, around the importance of listening to the end user and engaging them. And this will come out in our publication. Um, there are different ways to do this and the importance of this. And I think that as a sector, we can be a bit bad about knowing, thinking we know what someone needs instead of listening to what they want. So, um, yeah, it will be a good discussion. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and I appreciate not everyone has had a chance to comment, but Ignatius, I'm gonna to come to you now because I believe you're gonna wrap up for us. Um, but I just wanna thank everyone because this has been a great discussion. And I really hope that this is the first discussion of many around broadening how we talk about failure and how we engage in this as a sector in different ways. That This is one format, Larry's book is another. Um, so I really hope that, you know, the youth, the Water Youth Network and others continue what they're doing and the Wash Failures project will continue for as long as we have the energy uh, and there is a need. Uh, so, Ignatius, with that, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, to the fellow Water Youth Network member and the Rural Water Supply Network, thank you very much for co-hosting this special event. So to the attendees out there, all of, uh, let me quote Hank when he said, learn from the past. So we must not ignore the failures in our projects. So thank you very much. Short and sweet. Thank you, Ignatius. And um, again, thank you to the panel and Larry for his book and starting this all off. Uh, so without the book, we wouldn't be here. Jim, thanks for persevering through your internet um, issues. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Hank, thank you. Temple persists, Ignatius. There is a bright future for the um, water world out there with you guys spearheading it. So um, yeah, I think with that, thanks very much, everyone. And um, here's to future RWSN webinars. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. A very nice initiative. All right, thank you all. Bye for now. Special thanks to Melissa for all of the time and 